Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on electrochemistry. So this is topic 24 for the CIE specification. So this is the Cambridge Internationals. Um, if you're studying the CIE um, specification or the syllabus, then this video is perfect for you. Um, this is obviously just topic 24. There are loads of topics, as you're aware, for the CIE syllabus. Um, the full range, all of the topics for year one and year two chemistry are available on my YouTube channel, which is Allery Chemistry, and they're all available on there. All I ask is you hit the subscribe button just to show your support for this project. That will be absolutely brilliant. Um, these videos as well are, um, or these videos are made of um, PowerPoint slides, which are available to purchase to supplement your revision. They're great value for money. Um, if you just click on the description box, the link in the description box, it will take you to the test shop um, and you'll be able to purchase them from there. I have um, bundled them up as well into various kind of subcategories such as year one and year two chemistry. So they're available to, to purchase there if you wish to have them. Like I say, great for kind of supplement your revision notes. Right, let's get into this then. Um, now this one, um, you'll probably find again, we just move on to the next. There we are. Um, so with this one, this is quite a... Um, uh, the CIE topics kind of overlap quite a lot. Um, and you'll probably see there's a lot of um, topics that I'm referring to here. Obviously, this is relating to year two chemistry. Um, there is a, um, a similar topic. Um, there's not normally mirror topics for year one. Um, and obviously, this is to do with electrochemistry as well. So that one's looking at redox reactions, reduction, oxidation, etc. So I am assuming that you've got a reasonable understanding of oxidation numbers and redox, etc. Um, obviously, the concepts in here are quite tricky quite trick you know fairly quite demanding there's there's some a lot of physics and kind of equations and maths involved here i'll try and explain it as clearly as i can but it is really important that you have an understanding of redox reactions so if you're not too sure go and have a look back at that um in um in year one so just to start though we're going to look at um obviously this is electrochemistry so we're going to look at um electrochemical cells and and a lot of physics here so those of you who do physics like i say you'll probably make this you probably think this is quite straightforward um but the best place to start is how we set up a cell first so make sure you know the method for setting up these cells you can see i've got a diagram there oops i'm going the wrong way there we are you see we've got a diagram there um so the first thing when you're setting up a cell is you obtain the metals that are under investigation. So the ones which we're going to look at here, clean them with a bit of sandpaper or emery paper, anything like that, which would use to kind of remove any impurities from the surface of the metal first. Um, then the second step is that actually some metals have grease on the surface as well. Normally from when you obviously you're touching it with your hands, you've got oils on your hands that can transfer into the metal. This can interfere with the reactions. So normally you'd wash that with a bit of propanone um, and you can um, wear, some, um, so wear some gloves to prevent the contamination, obviously moving forwards. Um, so I think I spelled that wrong. <laughs> we'll get that changed. Um, step three, obviously place the metal into a solution, um, obviously containing the iron of the same metal that's under investigation. So for example, if we're using a copper electrode when we're setting up our cell, then we use copper sulfate solution in the same beaker. So basically copper sulfate solution produces the Cu2 plus iron, which is copper 2 plus. Um, and obviously that's the iron that corresponds to the metal electrode of copper. So you always use the iron um, you know, for the majority of cases anyway. Um, if you're using an oxidizing agent containing oxygen, then we'll need to add an acid to that as well. So for example, if it's potassium permanganate, then um, it's got to be acidified. So you've got to dissolve that in an acid. And then step four, we then add what we call a salt bridge. Now, salt bridge is basically just a generally a crude method. is a is a bit of filter paper. It's soaked in saturated, highly saturated potassium nitrate or potassium chloride um, solution, um, and basically that just links the two beakers together, as you can see. Um, as you can see on there, there it is. Um, and basically each end of this should be submerged in the relative solutions in each of the beakers either side there. And then the fifth step is obviously we connect the electrodes with wires and we put a voltmeter in there 
um, and then we'll get a reading. Hopefully, if we've set up all this correctly, we should get a reading in there. Now, these are cells. So this is basically, they've got a one half there and we've got one half there. And when we connect two half cells together, and we'll go through these in a moment, then they will, obviously the electrons will move from one reaction to another or vice versa. Um, and effectively the voltmeter is reading the potential difference between each one of these electrodes. And obviously later on, we will look at some of the chemical reactions associated with this as well. But what's really important is that when we're looking at electrochemistry, how we establish a cell, how do we make um, an electrochemical cell? And actually all the detail really for the rest of this video is going to look at the details behind the electrons being transferred, charges being transferred, etc. Or charges you know obviously moving around in the set in the actual um in the reaction um and just making sure we understand about feasibility so which reactions are likely to proceed and which are not so you've got various different factors here but this is a very high level overview of what that cell looks like and really everything else kind of looks into the detail so let's look at um electrolysis obviously electrolysis is is probably what well electrolysis is to do with um, obviously electrochemistry so but it's probably one of the most kind of well-known form of electrochemistry that we would have done and you probably would have done this at GCSE to be honest probably even sooner than that obviously at A level we're going to look at it in a lot more complicated detail but it's probably the most familiar that you've that you've come up with uh, that you've kind of come up against i suppose um so electrolysis is based just the splitting of a substance which is lysis that's what a lysis comes from using electricity hence electro so electrolysis is splitting of a substance using electricity that's it um, and obviously you're expected to predict some of the substances that are made on the back of electrolysis um, so um, we expect to know what the substance is made and the concentration of the electrolyte um, and the element's electrode potential value as well. Okay, so we've got a few things here. So let's start with um, a chemical equation. Now, chemical equations tell us useful information about the quantities needed to allow them to proceed. And so here we, um, here obviously here we're going to make an atom of iron. So it's Fe from Fe two plus. We need two electrons to actually um, to actually do that in the first place. So. In order to work out how much electricity is needed, um, to, obviously to make a mole of a product, it's dependent, obviously quite firmly, on the number of atoms that's actually involved in the reaction, so how many we've got, the number of electrons involved to make one atom, so some might produce two electrons, some might be one, um, the charge of the electron um, as well, so we'll work that out, we have to calculate that separately. So... We're going to introduce something called a Faraday constant, and um, this is basically used to help us in the calculations of, of working out charge, for example. So the Faraday constant, F, is the size of the charge per mole of electrons and has a value of 96, 500 um, coulombs per mole. So the, the charge, that value is fixed. Um, so you, know, you don't need to really be too concerned with that. And the expression kind of um, relating these things together um, is F is obviously the Faraday constant, and that equals L, which is Avogadro's constant. So that's the number of atoms or molecules in one mole of substance, remember? So that's from year one. Um, and E is the electron charge, um, so basically what, what the charge is on that. So you may be asked to work out the quantity of a charge passed in electrolysis or the mass of substance made in electrolysis. Okay, so we're going to look at some examples there. And to do that, we need to be able to understand about coulombs, what a coulomb is. So a coulomb is basically just a, a measure of the quantity of the electricity. So for example, if you have an amp, um, so one amp of electricity flowing for one second is one coulomb. Okay. Rel relatively straightforward so um, we can come up with another equation and we can say that actually the number of coulombs is effectively the current which is the flow of electrons obviously measured in amps multiplied by time in seconds in this case and then we can use this to calculate the number of moles of electrons that we've actually made and so obviously the number of moles of electrons is the number of coulombs which is the um uh, the number of coulomb is the, the measure of quantity of electricity divided by Faraday constant, which we know from just previously is 96,500 
uh, Coulomb's parole. Uh, so this is going to be important. We're going to look at an example here. There's a lot of equations thrown around here, but like with anything like this, it's about seeing it in practice and seeing kind of how it can be used and what things can be asked. So on the back of all of that, we can then work out the mass of substance produced by using the equation that you will have seen before in year one, which is mass equals moles divided by the relative atomic mass or the AR of the substance. So like I say, the best thing to do is to kind of see this in ex as an example and say, right, well, what things could I be asked for and how would I actually do them? Okay, so let's look at some calculations here first. And first, we're going to look at how we can calculate the mass of a substance produced during um, electrolysis. And we're going to use the same equation um, that, we, um, that we'd seen before. So here we're going to use an example of what mass of iron, that's Fe, is produced when 2.10 amps is passed through iron sulfate solution for 20 minutes. Okay, so we've got iron sulfate solution, put your electrodes in, um, this is not the same as a full cell equation as I mentioned before, but it's electrolysis. So we're going to put two electrodes in a beaker, iron sulfate solution in there. We're going to pass 2.1 amps through that for 20 minutes. I want to know how much iron are we going to produce from that. Okay, pretty useful to be honest. So let's have a look at the equation first of all. So the equation relating to this, this is your half equation. Fe2 plus, and you would have seen this in year one, Fe2 plus plus two electrons will form Fe. Okay, and obviously Fe is your solid. So first of all, we need to calculate the number of coulombs. Okay, so the number of coulombs is current multiplied by time. Remember that from the previous slide. So the number of coulombs, um, remember everything must be in seconds here. Obviously they've given us in minutes, so just be mindful of that, changing the units. So the number of coulombs is basically the current, which is we know is 2.10 amps. That's how much has passed through. Uh, and that's been done for 20 minutes. So it's 20 times 60. Okay, you multiply it by 60 to get it in seconds. So we've got 2,520 coulombs have passed through this solution over 20 minutes. So then, once we know that, we then um, we need to work out how many moles of electrons we have. So the number of moles is the number of coulombs that we've just worked out there, divided by Faraday constant, and that was 96,500. So it's 2520 divided by 96,500, and that gives us 2.61 times by 10 to the minus 2 moles of electrons. So now we know the number of moles of electrons, and always in chemistry, if you know the moles, you can get to many places from the moles. You can work out moles of other substances. You can work out masses. You can work out relative atomic masses. You can work out a load of different things. So if you get to the moles, you'll find a lot of these equations kind of get to the moles first, and then you kind of filter out to whatever you want to work out. So here we've got the number of moles of electrons. So from this point forwards, we can now obviously use this equation that we had before, and we can work out the number of moles of Fe. So we have a two to one ratio, as you can see there. So the, the ratio is two electrons to one um, Fe atom. So the number of moles of iron is going to be 2.61 times to the 10 to the minus two, okay? Um, which is this one here. It's the number of moles of electrons divided by two. And that means we have 0 0.013 moles of iron that's actually been produced there, as you can, as you can see there. And then finally, we can then say, right, well, we know the number of moles of iron. We can then work out the mass of iron, again, using the equation that we've seen in year one. Um, and this is mass equals moles times by the atomic, relative atomic mass of iron, which you find that in the periodic table, 55.8. And that gives us the total mass of iron of 0 0.73 grams. So here you can see what we've done is used these equations here, these values here, to work out the mass of iron that was produced. So essentially, practically, we've had a, a solution of iron to sulfate. We passed 2.1 amps through it and we've left it for 20 minutes. We've come back and then what you see, what you should see in the beaker is 0 0.73 grams of iron that has been produced. Pretty handy. Now, this is obviously really useful in industry because obviously we want to know how much products we produce for example aluminium could be a classic example where you make aluminium through electrolysis um, and you want to know how much aluminium you produce in an hour 
um, and then you can work out right well this is how this is the current that we're putting into it and then we can calculate how much aluminium we can make every single hour and then obviously that's your productivity rate so this is really useful because it, obviously in industry we do use electrolysis to make to extract metals from say solutions or their ores um, and knowing how much you can produce per hour is obviously vital from a business perspective as well so yeah really useful and obviously this allows us to do that Okay, just you need to know how to do, you need to kind of describe how to do this rather than kind of get involved with any kind of direct calculation as such. But Avogadro's constant L, and um, this can also be used, um, or can also be calculated, sorry, using electrolysis. Um, you just need to describe how we can do that. So, in order, remember, Avogadro's number is the amount, is the number of molecules or atoms in one mole of any substance. Okay, this is quite a big number. Um, but in order to measure Avogadro's number using electrolysis, we need to know how much of an element, for example, iron, is produced of a, sp a specified time period. And that's what we've just worked out there. Um, now, the current applied must be constant. In other words, it's not variance. So it must be all the way through for that period of time. And we must know the value of that as well. And obviously, we can use the F equals, um, uh, the F equals LE equation here and we can work out obviously the um, L bit by rearranging this equation here to work that out. So just make sure that obviously you're aware that they might be able to might ask you to work out Avogadro's constant, which is L from this this equation here as well. But the majority of it, to be honest, is going to be the previous slides. Make sure you're aware of how to work out the masses of substance, the number of moles of electrons produced, the number of moles of product produced as well. You know, and make sure you kind of use them equations. Um, you know. Well, you're familiar with them and comfortable with them. Okay, so the product produced at the electrodes, it depends if the substance is melted or if it's actually dissolved in solution. Now, a classic, classic example of this is, is salt, pretty much sodium chloride. So um, if we look at the electrolysis of that, the actual um, method or the kind of the kind of state that the um, sodium chloride is in will depend on what products are produced. Now you might have seen this, you might have done this reaction in fact um, in in the lab, um, but we're just going to use bog standard table salt, which is sodium chloride. And you're going to use this as an example. Now, if we melt sodium chloride and then undergo electrolysis, this is probably the easiest one, if I'm honest. Um, it's going to take some heat mine to melt sodium chloride but you know let's say we do um then what we'll get is chlorine gas so cl2 and this is produced at the anode which is the positive electrode so remember chlorine um so in in sodium chloride you form na plus and cl minus ions when we melt them so the ions will separate the cl minus ions will go off to the positive electrode so the anode and the sodium metal bit the na plus will move off to the negative electrode the cathode so remember the opposites attract so there's no other species involved here it's just sodium chloride so we just get two products that are actually produced now if we add an extra bit of complexity to this and say, right, well, actually, we're going to not melt the sodium chloride, we're actually going to dissolve it in water and we're going to form salt solution or brine. Okay, now we don't just have Na plus and Cl minus ions in that solution anymore. We've now got H plus ions and OH minus ions because that's formed from water and water can dissociate, i.e. can break down from H2O to H plus and OH minus ions. So now we've got four ions kind of floating around in this solution. Now, what happens um, is that when we, um, you know, when we switch on the electricity, you now have a hierarchy. They're now fighting to kind of move towards one side or the other. So in order to determine what substance is actually produced at the anodes and cathodes, we actually need to have a little bit of an understanding of the electrode potential values, or called E0, and that's what they're called. Now, we'll see a lot more on this later on, so don't, I don't kind of get bogged down into the actual values here. But effectively, um, we look at the half equations. You'll have equa you would have seen half equations from year one as well. But for the half equations for OH- and H+, and we look at the half equations for the Na plus and Cl minus ions as well. So we've got some three kind of half equations of three different reactions that's happening here. And we're gonna look at the electrode potential value of each of them reactions. So in other words, each half equation has what we call a value, an electrode potential value. 
So if we look at the electrolysis of concentrated sodium chloride solution, so it's highly concentrated, so saturated solution, um, and what we actually get is we get hydrogen gas produced at the um, at the cathode. Okay, now normally you would have if it was molten sodium chloride, you'd have Na plus moving to the cathode, and that forms sodium. But in this case, because you've got H plus ions knocking around in the solution as well. Um, they will actually accept electrons much more readily than Na+. And so because they will accept them much more readily, they will actually um, move over to the positive ion. They'll push the Na plus ions out of the way, go and grab that electron, um, and then form hydrogen gas at one end. So the sodium has just been muscled out here because hydrogen ions now exist. At the anode, so that's your positive electrode, then actually we produce chlorine gas at this side. Now this is the same as you know what was happening before. Um, there's a higher concentration of Cl minus ions in that solution than OH minus ions. Um, water doesn't dissociate as strongly, um, so you will produce OH minus and H plus ions, but you don't have as many. Just quite simply, you just don't have as many. OH minus ions as you do Cl minus ions and this is because we use a concentrated solution of hydrochloric acid uh, of sodium chloride sorry so um so this higher concentration means that again they kind of muscle out the OH minus ions Cl minus goes to the positive electrode bonds to form with another chlorine atom to form Cl2 and that's released at the other end so when you're when you do electrolysis of brine you'll see gases produced at one end and the other. Um, hydrogen, obviously, at one side, and you get this, obviously, smell of chlorine at the other side. Realistically, um, you should really do this in a fume cupboard or somewhere where it's well ventilated. Chlorine is toxic, so you shouldn't really breathe that in. Um, hydrogen is flammable, but, you know, it's not really going to cause too many issues. you just got to be aware that you're not going to kind of set off a, a spark or anything like that. So what we're trying to say here is that the the um, solution, if it's dissolved in solution, you have two extra species involved. You have OH minus and H plus ions. We've got to take into account them ions when dissolving stuff in solution. If it's molten, it's much more straightforward, as you can see. Okay. Right. So let's kind of go back a little bit. And I know right at the start, we introduced a full cell. Um, and then obviously, we then looked at electrolysis just to kind of get an understanding of what electrolysis is and about charge and electrons moved. So we're just going to kind of take a step back a little bit and we're going to introduce you to something called half cells instead. So a half cell is just one half of an electrochemical cell um, and they can be constructed of a metal dipped in its ions as we've seen before or you can have a platinum electrode with two aqueous ions if we need to. So not all it's really difficult sometimes you want to measure say um, the voltage or the, the potential difference should I say um, of solutions they don't have a metal electrode themselves so we have to use a, an inert metal of platinum so let's have a look and split this down now in the previous diagram I showed you how to make a full cell we're going to kind of break this down and look at the detail a little bit more so here we've got our metal electrode and here we've got iron and we've got a solution of its ions, um, which is in the beaker there, as you can see here. Okay, so this could be Fe2+, plus, it could be Fe3+, plus, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so if we had an ion electrode dipped into Fe2+, plus, for example, um, and um, that we'll get this reaction here. Now, if we connected it to another half cell, um, obviously it wouldn't do it on its own, but if we connected it to another half cell, this is the reaction that would happen. So the Fe2+, plus ions adding two electrons to iron. Now, obviously, it depends on which half cell you're connecting it with, but this is a reaction that could occur with this reaction here, okay? So we're going to produce iron. So if we have a half cell with two aqueous ions, um, as you can see in there, and we don't actually have a metal equivalent of them ions, or we're not testing that, then we have to use an inert but electrically conductive electrode. And here, platinum is a really, really good electrode to use. It's expensive, but very good for what it needs to do. Um, and here, for example, we might have a solution in here. We have a half equation of Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus. Now, none of these are metals like this here. These are basically two ions 
with different oxidation states. So there's no metal equivalent here. So to allow this reaction to happen and to allow the electrons to transfer, we need to use an electrode that's inert and won't actually interfere with this reaction here. And that's why we use platinum um, as, a, as a classic example. So you'll see that quite a bit. So an electrochemical cell, as I mentioned, as you just seen before, is basically created by joining two different half cells together. So you'll have two beakers, salt bridge between the two, electrodes either side and a voltmeter in between. Okay, so like I say, these cells are made from two half cells joined together with a wire, a voltmeter and your salt bridge, as I mentioned before. Um, now, Obviously, this is the diagram here. This is the setup. But when we connect two half cells together, so that's a half cell and that's a half cell. It's basically just half of a full cell, which is what that is. Um, we get one side of this undergoing a reduction process and the other side undergoing an oxidation process. So effectively, what we've got here is just a redox reaction. It's just bit beefed up um so we could mix these together in one pot and they'll react which is great but what we're trying to do here is we're effectively exploiting the fact that when these substances react in their own beakers they kind of move electrons from one place to another so that's fine but what we're doing here is we're kind of teasing the electrons out of one reaction and effectively reacting them but kind of keeping them separate at the same time and these will, will react because electrons have been transferred. But the clever bit about the cell is actually the electrons that have been transferred in these reactions are being pushed through this wire here, and we can then use it for our purposes of whatever we want to do. Here it's just a voltmeter, but that could be a bulb or you know, whatever, anything. Anything it has batteries in, mobile phones, torches, anything which has a battery in, we are effectively exploiting the electrons moving from one substance to another. Um, and this effectively all we're doing and the electrons then move back into here the flow of electrons moving here and complete the circuit so it's we, this is all it is it's just a reaction but we have to set it up in such a way that we can exploit the electron transfers that would happen anyway in these reactions so the voltmeter here is measuring the voltage between or the potential difference i know you probably have physicists screaming at it saying it's potential difference yeah that's fine um and there's two half cells and this is called the emf okay or e cell okay and we're going to see that quite a, quite a bit as well so electrons flow from a more reactive metal to a less reactive one that's really important okay common rule and so in this example the zinc half cell Okay, which is the one on the left here, shows the loss of electrons as zinc loses electrons easier than copper does um, and oxidation has actually occurred here. So zinc is producing zinc 2 plus and two electrons. So it's producing these two electrons. Okay, and what will happen is the observation that we'll see when this reaction, when this is all connected together, is the zinc electrode will actually become thinner um, because the zinc is being um, used up to produce zinc 2 plus ions and two electrons the concentration of zinc 2 plus ions here will increase so you get more of these and less of that so this will get thinner and thinner and thinner over time okay the electrons that were produced will have to go somewhere the electrons will go up and through this wire there we are okay so they'll go through that wire and they'll come down to here and copper's like well i'll take them thank you very much so the copper will accept the electrons that were produced here it's gone through this wire we've used it for our benefit which is which is great and um, but also the electrons then feed back down into copper copper will take the two electrons and um, so the copper two plus sorry the solution will take the two electrons and form copper what we'd see is we get a buildup of copper. So this electrode will fatten up because you're producing a lot more copper here and the concentration of Cu2 plus ions will reduce over time because they're being used up, reacting with the electrons to form copper. Now, so long as this equilibrium here, this exists, then we will always get electrons being produced. It's not everlasting because the zinc electrode will disappear. And if that thins out too much, it won't work. So it's important that we keep this equilibrium going and the salt bridge helps to just keep that equilibrium established that's what it's trying to do and try and get as much of the electricity out as we can so the salt bridge they go potassium nitrate 
there we are. And the salt bridge, it's a, a filter paper, like I say, just saturated with potassium nitrate. And the ions flow through this, and this just keeps the balance, um, which balances obviously all the charges out. So you don't really need to know a lot about the salt bridge. The main kind of star of the show here is the half cells. That's really what the examiners are wanting you to kind of focus on. Okay, so we've seen half cells and um, we've seen them kind of connecting together and we've seen kind of the mechanics of it and how that works. We're now going to kind of zoom in and look at half cells in particular. Now, each half cell, you get loads of different types of half cells, you get loads of different varieties. As you can imagine, you've got loads of different metals and solutions that can react with. Um, so each half cell has an electrode potential value, an E0 value, and that's measured in volts. And this tells us how easy the half cell gives up electrons, basically, um, how easily it's oxidized. So remember, oxidation, the acronym, oil rig, oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain. So the E0 value basically tells us how easily does that element give up, or ion, give up an electron, and in other words, oxidized. So you would have noticed on the previous slides that the two half cells have a reversible reaction. Okay, so they can go one way or the other. So you've got zinc um, half cell and the copper one at the top as well. So in electrochemical cells, we always write the equations in what we call the reduced form. So whenever you see these written down in your exam or data sheets, you'll always see them written as plus two electrons or plus something plus plus electrons basically see the electrons on the left hand side basically that's what we mean so um we always show um equations with reduction in the forward direction so remember reduction is the gain of electrons so all these half cells will always be showing electrons being gained okay now obviously in reality this doesn't happen not everything will accept electrons some reactions will give up electrons in fact you have to have that if you want a redox reaction so Remember, when we connect these two half cells together, we always have one that's undergoing reduction and one that's going oxidation. We can't have a system where you have both are reduced because it just, just can't happen. So to work out which has been reduced and which has been oxidized, we need to look at the E0 values that each half cell has. And a data book will tell you this, or you might have it in your exam, etc. Okay, you will be given these. So let's have a look here. So here, here are the E0 values for these half reactions. Okay, now this is under standard conditions. Okay, so we can see here that the zinc ion, zinc 2 plus and zinc half cell, has a negative E0 value. Okay, and the Cu2 plus Cu has a positive value, as you can see there. So what we need to know is we need to remember another acronym here. Now you might have your own, you might have this there's a few ways in which you can kind of um, learn this or it might be taught slightly differently. I appreciate that. I'm just going to go through a method which I think, you know, it works. Obviously, there's loads of other methods as well. But this is a method which I'm going to kind of talk you through. And if you think, yeah, OK, this seems quite, quite a good method, then you're more than happy to obviously use it if you want. If you have another method and it comes with the same answer, use it. OK, I'm, there's no right or wrong way necessarily of doing these things. All that matters is obviously you can show you're working and obviously it can be um, it can be used to provide the right answer. Obviously, that's important. So I'm going to use this rec uh, this kind of acronym here and I'm going to uh, remember the rule of no problem. OK, so no problem is the most negative half cell will undergo oxidation. So that's the no bit. OK, um, and the most positive half cell, which is this, will undergo reduction, which is the PR for problem okay so that's where I'm going to kind of use it remember to use this I'm going to bring this back up again later so in this case the zinc zinc 2 plus half cell here is the most negative so this will be the half cell where oxidation takes place okay uh, and oxidation remembers the loss of electrons so what we do when with the most negative one is we flip that equation round Okay, we, we spin it right round, and effectively we've got zinc to zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons. All we've done is flipped it round, because that's the most negative, and that's going to go oxidation. Oxidation is the loss of electrons, and you can see this equation is showing that zinc is losing the electrons to form zinc 2 plus. So, in this cell, we have zinc giving up the electrons, and copper accept, are accepting them. And we can combine these two half equations together to give the overall equation which works. So this is zinc reacting with the copper 2 plus ions to form zinc 2 plus ions and copper. 
Okay, and this is the overall equation that, that happens. Okay, let's look at a, um, another type of um, electrode. Now, this is called a SHE, a standard hydrogen electrode. Now, the standard hydrogen electrode is a reference electrode, so it's used to measure the electrode potentials that we've just seen there before. Like I say, you can't just dip a bit of copper in some copper 2 plus solution, put that in the solution and measure the electrode potential. You can't do that. Um, the only way we can work out what the E0 values are for each of these half cells is if we compare it or connect it to a reference, um, a, a reference half cell. Um, so the reference half cell we use to get them E0 values is called the standard hydrogen electrode, the SHE. So the electrode potentials of half cells, like I say, they can't be measured on their own, and we've got to use a SHE, so a standard hydrogen electrode, and this has an E0 value which is equivalent to zero volts. So basically, whatever volt, uh, whatever kind of, um, whatever the, the value of the potential difference on the voltmeter is, is basically equal to the value of the um, e naught of the half cell that we're testing. So let's have a look. Here's an example here. So let's say we want to work out the e naught value of this half cell here. So this is copper to copper 2 plus. So what we do is we connect it up to this, um, to the she, which you can see here. And the she is made up of hydrogen going in at 298 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals. So that goes into like a, a glass tube, as you can see here. Um, we also have um, one mole of H plus ions. So this is this has come from an acid. So it's one mole, let's say HCl, for example. Um, in this here, we have um, a same amount of copper two plus ions. You have one mole per dm cubed of Cu two plus ions. And the standard um, is important. The standard kind of the kind of word standard. So the E naught values are affected by changes in concentration, the pressure of the whole system. Um, the temperature of the room that we're doing this in as well. And in order to compare E0 values, we must meet a very strict criteria of standard um, kind of conditions. So that must be temperature at 298 Kelvin. It's got to be 100 kilopascals of pressure that's been put in here. And the concentrations of all ions, whether that's in the SHE or whether it's in the, um, the kind of half cell under test, must be one mole per dm cubed. Okay, and the diagram we see on the left here, it shows the standard hydrogen electrode, which is this here, obviously the SHE. This is connected to the copper to copper 2 plus half cell. And assuming all, obviously all these conditions are met, then whatever the value is in here will basically be the E0 value for this half cell here, because we know that this one is zero. Okay, um, just a word of warning. Um, obviously, we need one more per cubed of H plus signs in here. Now, one mole of one mole per dm cubed of H plus ions can be produced by using um, one mole of HCl, hydrochloric acid. But if we're using sulfuric acid, something like H2SO4, then we only actually need half a mole or half mole per dm cubed of sulfuric acid, because for every molecule of sulfuric acid that's put in, that will produce two H plus ions. So we only need half the strength of that to produce that. So this is the amount of H plus ions, not the acid that's being used. Okay, that's really, really important. Okay, so we looked at half cells. We've looked at the she. We know how to produce the E0 values. We know what E0 means in terms of oxidation and reduction. Um, we're now going to look at a series. Now, this is not something you might find on Netflix or anything like this. Um, this is um, this is a series of electrochemical <laughs> electrochemical series. It's not quite as exciting. Um, so half cell reactions. Um, let's have a look. So this is just an example of something you might see. Now the series is much more extensive than this in reality, but quite often you'll be given some data and you'll just be given data that you kind of need to use or may need to use in the future. So um, here's an example of one. Um, and you can see we've got a range of different equations. Remember, they're all shown in the um, reduced form. Okay, so basically they're all plus two electrons or plus electrons. Um, all of them all written there as standard. And we have our standard electrode potentials, as you can see on the right hand side. So this is obviously in descending order. And um, this is got obviously starting from an E0 value at the top to a negative value. They may be the other way around. 
But basically, as we go up the table here, we've got a stronger oxidizing agent. Now remember, oil rig, oxidation is the loss of electrons, reduction is the gain. But the oxidizing agent, okay, um, will gain electrons. Okay, so any substances, remember the positive E0 value means it all it's likely to proceed by that way. So this reaction here, the chlorine here, is very likely to accept two electrons to form two Cl minus. So chlorine is a stronger oxidizing agent. So oxidizing agents gain electrons. Whereas, so there we are, so agents on the left hand side of the equation are more easily reduced. So these are stronger oxidizing agents. If you're getting a bit confused over this bit, go back and have a look at the um, the video for year one where we looked at the electrochemical electrochemistry for year one, um, where we looked at what an oxidizing agent is and a reducing agent. It is vitally important that you understand the difference between oxidation and an oxidizing agent. So oxidation is the loss of electrons. An oxidizing agent will gain electrons. And the more easily an atom can gain electrons, the more powerful the oxidizing agent is. Okay. So obviously, um, the most powerful oxidizing agent here is chlorine. The weakest one is Mg2+. This is not likely to accept electrons. And obviously, going the other way, we've got stronger reducing agents. So these are agents on the right-hand side of the equation. So these ones are more likely to be oxidized. So this is very likely to give up electrons and produce mg2 plus so magnesium is the more powerful reducing agent here um so they have an increased tendency to lose electrons um and obviously the most powerful reducing agent is magnesium the weakest one is chlorine you're going to be seeing a lot of this okay we're going to be talking a lot about oxidizing agents and reducing agents just make sure you're familiar with that it's going to be really important Okay, so the standard electrode potential, so this is E0, this can be used to actually calculate the standard cell potential. Okay, so this is the, the E0 of the entire cell. So E0 of the cell is basically E0 of the reduced half cell minus E0 of the oxidized half cell. Okay, so it's a little bit like, you can remember it as redox. Okay, so it's reduced minus, uh, minus oxidized, okay, so like redox. Okay, so remember your half cell equation with the most negative E0 value is being oxidized. Okay, so remember that. Um, and if you have two positives or two negatives, then it's the most negative that's oxidized. Okay, we'll look at some examples here. So let's have a look. So we're going to use this data here, okay, um, in the electrochemical series. I'm going to calculate the E0 of the cell when a Cl2 and Cl minus half cell and a zinc 2 plus and zinc half cell are actually connected together. So the first thing we need to do when we're faced with this question is you know to identify which has been oxidized. Um, and obviously in this case, the zinc 2 plus and zinc half cell is the most negative. So let's have a look. So we've got the Cl2 to Cl minus, which is that one. And then you've got your zinc 2 plus and zinc, which is that one. That one's the most negative, definitely. Okay, so this is the one that's been oxidized. Okay, so remember, no problem. Yeah, negative oxidized and um, positive reduced. Yeah, so no problem. So this one is the one that's been oxidized. So this is the one we're going to put on the right hand side. So it's 1.36 minus minus 0 0.76, which is this one here. And this gives the total E0 of the cell of 2.12 volts. Second example, so we're going to use this data again in the electrochemical series to calculate the E0 when Cl2 and Cl- and your copper 2 plus and copper cells are connected. Now both of these have positive values, but this is the least negative, uh, sorry, this is the more, most negative value. So this is the one that's going to be oxidized, okay? So we put that into the equation on the right hand side. And so therefore we should get 1.36 minus 0.34 and that gives you the E0 of the cell of 1.02 volts. Very important, okay, you must remember. Remember, no problem. So negative is oxidized, yeah, and positive is reduced and just make sure you understand what we mean by obviously reduction and oxidation. Okay, so electrode potentials, these can change 
if the conditions deviate away from the standard conditions. So, like we've seen with electrode potentials, they involve reversible reactions. And like any other reversible reaction, the equilibrium changes depending on the reaction conditions. Okay, so like we've seen before with Le Chatelier's principle. So, a half cell, or the value of the E0, uh, the E0 value of the half cell, is affected by temperatures, or changes in temperature, concentration, and pressure, if obviously we've got gas involved. So, if we change the equilibrium position of the cell, if we change the equilibrium position, then the cell potential value can also change as well. And this is why we use standard conditions to measure electrode potentials. And obviously, if we do this, we can actually make sure that we're getting E0 values that are comparable. So we can compare the relative um, oxid oxidation and reduction power of each individual species in the half cell so using these standard obviously the standard um, values allows us to make that comparison we will look at some examples later on we'll look at the Nernst equation which sounds very um, very complicated we'll look at that where some of these are not standard we have to kind of take that into account okay so let's look at cell notation now we'll see before we drew a nice diagram with a beaker and we've got a half um, uh, we've got your, your half cells, obviously you've got your uh, salt bridge and you've got your metals and ions and solutions, etc. Now that's a bit of a, a little bit of a faff to draw out. So in chemistry, we like to kind of simplify that and draw what we call a standard cell notation. And it's the way in which you kind of represent a cell in a, in a simpler form. And there's a standard way in which that must be written. So a standard way is basically the most negative half cell potential goes to the left of this double line. So in fact, we've got the double line in the middle and this represents, um, or this double line um, is kind of like the salt bridge, which we'll come on to in a moment. But the most negative half cell goes on the left hand side of that and the most positive obviously goes to the right. So um, when we write this, we have the reduced form of that half cell on one side and the oxidized form of that half cell, the most oxidized form of that half cell on the right hand side. Now what we do is we separate the two um, with a physical change. So if you had, say for example, copper and copper 2 plus, copper 2 plus is the oxidized form because that is a plus 2 charge and copper is obviously 0, has an oxidation state of 0. So we'd put copper on the left solid line to represent that we've got a metal and an aqueous solution so there's a physical state change and obviously copper 2 plus would go here like i say the solid double line involves a salt bridge that obviously represents the salt bridge so let's have a look we're going to use that zinc copper cell that we'd seen before now zinc is the most negative half cell so that goes to the left of this double line out of the zinc half cell, zinc 2 plus is the most oxidized form. So that one goes closest to the double line. Solid line represents a phase change from aqueous to solid. And obviously zinc sits on the other side. Exactly the same with copper as well on the other side of the, of the notation there. There we are. So zinc 2 plus is plus 2. Obviously zinc is an oxidation state of 0. So what if you have two aqueous ions then? Um, so if we follow the same rules as above, we can actually separate the solutions using a comma. We don't use a solid line for this. Okay, so the solid line is only there to represent the a physical state change. Okay, so let's have a look. So we're going to use Fe3 plus and Fe2 plus. So these are the two ion solutions. And we've got Mg2 plus and Mg. Okay, which is here. So we've got your double line. There's your salt bridge there. So you've got Mg2+, plus, which is there. And we've got Mg, which is obviously on the left here. So we do have physical state change. We've got solid to aqueous. So we've put the, double, we've put the single line there, and that's fine. But with this one, we've got Fe3+, plus and Fe2+. Plus. So here we're going to use platinum. That's our electrode, because obviously neither of these are solid. So platinum is going to go on the side there. That's a solid with a solid line. You've got Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. Fe3 plus is the most oxidized form. As you can see on there, so we're going to use the platinum half cell, which is there. Um, Fe3 plus is the most 
oxidized form so that goes closest to the salt bridge fe2 plus is obviously slightly more reduced but we're separating the two ions using a comma instead of a line because there's no state change here they're both aqueous okay right so we're now going to kind of use this and we're going to predict if reactions will actually proceed and if they'll go ahead and again we can use the standard electrode potentials the e naught can be used to predict if a reaction will actually occur under standard conditions so here we're going to bring this um, electrochemical series back up again we're going to put it obviously in the bottom left of the screen so let's look at example one so we're going to use the data in the electrochemical series to predict whether solid magnesium will react with copper two plus ions in solution under standard conditions okay fairly straightforward so the first thing we need to do um, is we need to identify which is being oxidized okay so we've got mg2 plus an mg half equation so this one here uh, let's have a look see so we've got magnesium and magnesium two plus this is right at the bottom here um, and then we have copper two plus ions as well there we are so we've got that one there so obviously this one is the most negative remember no problem okay this one's the most negative so this one is going to be oxidized okay this is your magnesium one here so because this is oxidized we reverse the equation we flip it around the other way okay and we write the two equations next to each other like this so we've got the oxidized version at the top and the reduced version at the bottom so this is obviously our two half equations here so we've got one oxidized one reduced and then what we do is we combine these two equations and what this will tell us is the feasible reaction so this is saying right the reaction which is feasible is actually the reaction where magnesium reacts with copper two plus to form mg2 plus and copper solid so then what we do is we compare that equation to the one that was actually stated in the initial uh, question and we can say that magnesium will react with copper two plus ions because obviously that's our feasible reaction so therefore the answer is here yes this definitely will work and we can actually confirm this or this is correct this is a correct statement to make so we can confirm this obviously we use that e naught cell reaction and remember all feasible reactions will have a positive e naught cell value or e cell value so put the numbers in so it's 0.34 okay that's the reduced form remember um minus minus 2.38 and that gives us plus 2.72 volts definitely a feasible reaction that's positive okay so let's look at a, another example this is example two um here we're going to use the data in the electrochemical series to justify why iron nails become rusty when in contact with air and moisture so it's a different approach to this question we're asked to justify we know that they do go rusty that's not what we're disputing but we need to make sure we can justify that we can back that statement up okay so we've got these two here these are the two we're going to use so we've got this one which is obviously oxygen and water that's normally in the atmosphere that's the half cell there and the half cell for iron iron two plus so that's iron and iron two plus obviously this is the rust so first thing we need to identify just like we've done before which has been oxidized and which has been reduced so obviously these were all written in the reduced form remember the most negative is being oxidized so this is the most negative so it's that iron equation there that we flip round the other way we flip it completely round say that's been oxidized we keep the other one the same and these are the two half cells that we've got so what we've got to make sure though here is because we're going to combine these equations to get the feasible reaction is we've got to make sure the number of electrons top and bottom are the same so in this top one here we're going to multiply everything by two to make sure the number of electrons are the same in the top and the bottom because we're going to cancel these out eventually so then obviously when we combine these equations we should get 2fe reacting with oxygen plus two lots of water will form fe2 plus and four lots of oh minus that's produced so what we do is we then compare this obviously equation to the reaction stated in the question and we can see that iron will react with oxygen and water and they match so what we've done is we've justified that we've said okay yeah we definitely know that iron 
does this because this is the only one which is feasible this reaction here so iron does react with oxygen to form and water to form fe2 plus and obviously that makes the rust again we can confirm this by putting it into an e cell equation if you wanted to so we just put the numbers in and we've got a positive value which tells us that it's definitely feasible Okay, so let's look at a third reaction, or a third example, should I say. Okay, so the, again, um, the electrode potentials of the E0, they can be used to predict if a disproportionation reaction is likely to proceed. Now, again, you would have seen this in the electrochemical um, topic in year one. So this is just kind of developing on that or building on that. So disproportionation, just as a reminder, is where an atom or an element, sorry, is um is simultaneously oxidized and reduced in the same reaction so we're going to use this um this data here so we've got use the following data we've got ag plus um an ag plus plus an electron from ag and ag2 plus plus electron to ag plus so we're going to predict whether ag plus this one here this iron will disproportionate in solution so will it be simultaneously reduced and oxidized in the same reaction so let's have a look so we're going to identify which one has been oxidized so we say that ag plus and ag half equation um, is the most negative e naught value so it's this one that's oxidized now, obviously, we take that one and we flip it round. We reverse it and we write the two equations side by side like that. We then combine the two equations and this is going to obtain our feasible reaction. So we've got Ag plus Ag2 plus will form two lots of Ag plus. Now, we want to try and find out if this is a disproportionation reaction. So we need to compare that with the one that was stated in the question and we can see that actually ag plus here will not disproportionate in solution okay so this won't disproportionate at all okay and we can confirm this because actually when we write it out uh, we can say that obviously the the e naught value is minus 1.20 a negative value basically tells us this reaction will not go it's not feasible okay so that's really important you see here this is not disproportionating at all so really important really critical okay so make sure you're kind of aware you've got to like i said there's a lot of overlap with the cie topics this relies on you to have an understanding of the year one chemistry where disproportionation reactions were introduced and obviously this just builds up on that okay let's have a look at another one um so when we calculate E0, okay, so just because we calculate E0 to state a feasible reaction doesn't necessarily mean, or to state a feasible reaction, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will actually go. So when you look at a reaction, you say, right, well, I can't see anything going on here. So non standard conditions. So if we change, remember, if we change the concentration or the temperature, this can actually cause the electrode potential to change. Okay, and then a reaction that was feasible under standard conditions can quite easily become non-feasible when we change any of these conditions here. So let's take that rusty nail example that we'd seen before. Okay, so we've got Fe2 plus, plus two electrons will form Fe, which is obviously your solid, and that's obviously got an E0 value of minus 0 0.44 volts. And then we've got our oxygen one here. So this is iron reacting with the oxygen. Okay. E0 of the cell, when we work this out, comes out as plus 0.84 volts. So under standard conditions, this reaction is a feasible reaction. If we increase the concentration, I need to really kind of concentrate here <laughs> to kind of use an expression. So if we increase the concentration of O2, which is this bit here, okay, equilibrium will shift to the right, okay, which means it's easier for oxygen okay to gain the um, electrons and so the electrode potential for this half cell will become more positive okay and so therefore the cell potential that should be cell not fell cell potential will actually be higher as a result now if we increase the concentration of fe which is this bit here okay um then um, the equilibrium will shift left 
okay and so therefore less electrons will be used up so remember the most negative this one here will be flipped the other way around so basically we're producing so basically it'll be fe will produce fe2 plus plus two electrons remember that's the most negative that should be flipped the other way around so if we increase the concentration of iron okay so we increase that equilibrium will shift to try and reduce that so um equilibrium will actually kind of shift to um produce more electrons okay so less electrons will actually be, be used up in this case okay so we get a less negative value so kinetics um are not favorable um so that could be an example as well so for example the rate of reaction could be so slow that it appears there is no reaction um at all so for example rusting is a really slow process um and if the reaction is a high activation energy again it may stop the reaction from happening altogether so a catalyst can help obviously speed up that reaction too okay so it's really important we've got to understand that sometimes just because a reaction is feasible that the reaction conditions can change that and i suppose to kind of put a little bit more detail onto this or use an equation and um, we can use the nernst equation okay and the nernst equation can help to um basically help calculate or quantify the the kind of non-standard conditions and kind of go through it a little bit more detail what we mentioned before so like i say when a cell operates under non-standard conditions as we said before we can quantify this using the Nernst equation now it's a bit of a beefy equation as you can kind of see there um so let's go through the different parts of it so the e naught bit as you've seen before is the electrode potential value okay z under here is the number of electrons that's actually been transferred in the in the equation um oxidation and reduced species here um is basically the concentration of the species so obviously this is more complicated when you come across solid substances obviously they won't have a concentration um and here obviously if we're using a solid um say if we've got the half cell with a solid and a solution then we just put the value of one for the solid and just keep it keep it fixed so we're going to use um you need to be able to kind of be familiar with these half equations in particular um to be able to use the nernst equation so here we're actually going to use an example so here we're going to use um we're going to look at copper so look at the copper half cell the cu half cell um we're going to say what is the electrode potential of a copper of copper in a solution containing 0.2 moles per dm cubed of copper 2 plus ions so our oxidized species is the one with the largest oxidation number so um cu2 plus um which is obviously cu2 plus so our reduced species will be copper okay so the number of electrons transferred will be z this would be two and so the e naught value is 0 0.34 volts so you can see here we've got copper there we are so we've got copper going to copper two plus which is this here there's your electrode 0 0.34 volts e naught value sorry two electrons have been transferred okay and so this is the species obviously where this is the highest um the highest oxidation number so what we're going to do is put the numbers into the nernst equation okay so e naught so the energy required here so e naught is 0 0.34 which is there plus 0 0.059 that remains the same divided by two because we've got two electrons being produced for the copper one here okay the log of 0 0.2 so that's the concentration that's the moles of copper that's produced that's what we're told there uh, and this is one because that's a solid obviously the copper bit is actually solid so we can then obviously calculate this through i'm just showing you the breakdown now i'll not run through all the individual figures um but e which is this bit here um because the energy um is plus 0 0.32 volts this is the e of the cell okay so the e cell bit now we can see here that this is under non-standard conditions here so the concentration remember standard conditions you must have one mole per dm cubed of copper two plus ions here we've been told we have less than that we have a weaker solution 0 0.2 moles per dm cubed of copper now this is lower than that standard conditions now Le Chatelier's principle suggests that equilibrium in this example will shift left okay and we should see a decrease in the e value which obviously we do see that so obviously if we have a lower concentration 
of Cu2+, plus, then equilibrium will try and shift to replace some of the copper 2 plus here. In theory, this is obviously under standard conditions. So under standard conditions, you'd have one more per dm cubed of Cu2 plus ions. But if we reduce the concentration of this and have less Cu2 plus ions, then equilibrium will shift to the left to try and replace them. And the effect is that this value here should decrease. Now, when we put it into the Nernst equation, we get a figure that has actually decreased 0.32 because the standard value is 0.34. Um, and obviously that basically this equation just demonstrates that and proves that actually equilibrium has shifted to the left. And as a result, the voltage, the E0 of the value has reduced as well. So this is what the Nernst equation is, is telling us. Okay, so we just need to kind of look at the final bits of this. And this kind of feeds into the um, previous topic where we looked at topic 23, which is looking at Gibbs free energy. So this kind of brings that little bit of information from there. So if you haven't seen topic 23 video, please look at that first before you go any further with this. But we're going to look at the relationship between the standard electrode potential and Gibbs free energy. Relatively straightforward, this bit. So you need to know how the equation... Um, between E0 cell and delta G. Okay, so here's the equation first. So you've got Gibbs free delta G equals minus N, and N is the number of electrons transferred in the reaction. E0 is obviously E0 of the cell, E0 cell there, and F is the Faraday constant, which we've seen before and has a fixed value of 96,500 pounds, uh, 96,500 coulombs, moles to the minus one. Okay. <laughs> There we are. So, um, yeah, so this has got this fixed value at these standard conditions, obviously, standard uh, conditions there. So, let's bring this back in. This is just as a reminder here, this bit. And obviously, there's our electrode potential, our electrochemical series here. So, let's consider a reaction between magnesium and copper 2 plus ions. And what we're going to do is calculate delta G here. Now, remember, if delta G is negative or zero, then the reaction is feasible. So first thing is we need to identify which has been oxidized. So here the Mg2 plus and Mg half equation is uh, or has the most negative E0 value. So there it is, Mg, Mg2 plus minus 2.38. So that's actually been oxidized. And then we take that oxidized equation, we flip it round and we write the two equations side by side. So we've got copper and magnesium. And then we combine the two reactions. Now, this will give us our feasible reaction. So this is the one that will go under standard conditions. And then what we can do is then calculate the E0 of the cell. Um, and all feasible reactions, remember, will have an E0, um, a positive value. So we put the, the figures in here. So it's um, 0 0.34. So it's reduced minus oxidized, which is 2.38. And that will give us plus 2.72 volts. So that's the E0 of our cell. And then we can use this equation to work out um, delta G. So delta G is minus N E naught of cell times by um, the um, Faraday constant. So we've got minus two, because we've got two electrons being transferred, times by 2.72, times by 96,500. And that will give us a delta G value in joules per mole of minus 524,960 joules per mole so this reaction because it's negative is definitely feasible okay so a negative delta g tells you that this reaction will there we are will proceed okay so this is definitely a feasible reaction right so that's it so a lot of information there this is probably going to be one of the trickiest topics i think out there in for year two there's a lot of different kind of redox and oxidations etc the key thing here is practice, practice, practice. Past papers are really important. Like I said, there's a full series of um, the CIE um, electrochemistry. Uh, there's a full series, sorry, of year one and year two videos for CIE. This is obviously just one of them on alloy chemistry. Um, please hit the subscribe button to show your support for this project. That will be massively appreciated. Um, like I say, these slides are available to purchase as well. They're great to kind of supplement your revision notes. Um, and obviously you can use them on your tablet or smartphone click on the link in the description box below you'll be able to get a hold of them there um, so that's it go and get yourself a, a nice strong cup of tea or cup of coffee that was quite a, a quite a marathon a lot of information there but um, i hope it helped anyway 
All right, that's it. Bye-bye.